for unto us, unto us. And we are picking this up in Isaiah chapter number nine, verses number six. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Awesome, good. Let's keep it up there just for a moment. I highlighted some areas here because I want you to see how this verse changes tense from present tense to future tense. It says, for unto us a child, what? Is born, and, and unto us a son is given. And then it said, the government it says, now will be. You know, it changed to will be. The same one that is born will be, is born, will be called Wonderful Counselor. Uh, the Bible says that because it's talking about the prophecy of Jesus. This is 800 years before the birth of Jesus. 800 years before his birth, the prophet Isaiah says, for thus a child is born. I mean, if he's born, that means he's born now, but it's not until 800 years later that his name will be called and he will be. So it tells us that whenever God speaks, God is speaking in the present tense. Whatever God has for you, whatever you believe in God for, whatever you can pray for, whatever in your imagination, God has it for you right now. But it may not reach you for an appointed time. If this prophecy was speaking right now, a child is born right now, but in time is when he will be presented to the world. But he is there for us. What God has for you is for you right now. Every prayer that you could pray, everything that you can believe God for is already yours. Amen. Amen. That's what the scripture wants you to know. It's already yours. It's, you don't have to say, well, I hope what he says is already done. It's already done. We say God when, and God says not yet. I don't know if you had parents like that. You want it now, but you say not yet. You're waiting for an appointed time. There's sometimes things are happening before you can receive what you're praying for. You may not be ready for what you're praying for right now. Have you ever gotten something a little bit too soon and you weren't prepared for it? If we're not prepared for it, we don't tend to honor what we get. True. Jamie Foxx was saying that when he was younger, in his teen years, he was playing piano in churches. and he, they, was hired, they were hiring him out. So he was playing all over the place, and he said they were paying him for this. But he knew he'd come home, and he was staying with his grandmother. His grandmother said, give me the money. <laughs> so he would he'd give it to her, and she'd give him a little bit back to spending money or whatever. And he says and he was playing, he, was, he said he was making good money at that time. But she was like, okay, bring it. He thought that was so unfair. But then he got to college, and he was struggling. And he was working a job, and he was on campus and going back and forth, and he, was, he needed transportation, and he was struggling financially. He called his grandmother. And his grandmother says, you know, God has always been looking out for you. And then she sent him a check that was exceeded what he ever could have, could have wanted, enough for the car, enough for living expenses and all that. And what she sent him was the earnings Everything that he had earned over that time, she had kept for him. She wasn't keeping it from him, as he thought so. She was keeping it for him. Sometimes we believe God is keeping things from us. But God says, no, I'm keeping things for you. Yeah, go ahead. Give him a, give him a, give him a hand praise. The scripture even goes on to tell us, in, in, second, in First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 9, this, it makes it so clear. It says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Let's keep that up for a moment. When did God prepare that? He has prepared it for us. That means things that your eye has not seen, your ear has not heard, has not even conceived. God says, I've got stuff for you that will blow your mind. I have prepared for you blessings unseen that are much greater than what you can see. Can you believe God for the unseen 
and the unknown. He says, I have prepared for you. And says, for those, there's a qualification for those who love him. So with God, if I got all this, where, where, where is this stuff? Because we like to know where it is. We can get to it, right? We want access to it. You know, back to that thing with Jamie. If his grandmother had given him his money when he was making it along the way, what would he have had later on? Do you understand that? There's an appointed time when things take place because if we get it too soon, it's just, it's just like too little too late. Too much too soon is just as bad as too little too late. We would tend to ruin it, to ruin the blessing. So he got it at an appointed time when he needed it most. He needed it most. And scripture says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. God has revealed to us things through his spirit. Spirit. Now, how do I get to those things? We enter the Spirit of God through prayer, meditation, and fasting. That's how you enter God's Spirit. You, in the natural, want to receive things. You want to understand things in your natural. You'll never receive some things in your natural. You'll only get it when you go into the Spirit of God. That means you have to spend time in prayer, time in fasting, time in meditation. And if you don't have it yet, spend more time and more time. And as you begin to get indwelled in spirit, you start to receive that things become more clearer to you. But we always want to see it in our natural. But it's in the spirit. I've shared before an artist or athletes or people that reach high levels, you can only go so far in your natural to get further, you have to transcend into spirit. Musicians know that most of all, because musicians, you can only achieve so much by learning. At some point, your craft, your art, whatever it starts teaching you, but it only teaches you through spirit. You can learn things up to a certain point, and after a while, you're doing stuff that you never learned, stuff that people have not seen before. Things are being revealed to you. You're bringing out something new to the world. The world seeing something fresh because why? It's being revealed to you through spirit. A new form. God's trying to do a new thing in every one of us, but he reveals it to us through spirit. That's where we struggle. We want things to come in the natural. God says, well, you're moving to the spirit. That's where the things I have for you are in spirit. You go there and that's when you receive it. Uh, look at another scripture in Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 5. It's talking about Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded. See that past tense again? Was. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we what? Are healed. What was done for him allows us to be healed now. Now, we want everything to happen naturally. We got an issue. We want things to happen in our natural. But it's saying it, the, the, the antidote for this is in our spirit. Let's see if you can go into the spirit. And if you can go into your spirit, you can gain everything that God has for you in, your, in the spirit. You come back, it'll be present for you in your natural. But you have to get access to it. See, everything is accessible. We got to get access to it through his spirit. Imagine if you're sick and you, and you need healing and you go into the spirit, you're praying, you're fasting, you're meditating on God's word, and you're staying there until, as old people say, until your change comes. You're staying in spirit. You go there, you receive your healing in spirit. And then when you come back to your natural, it's already been manifested because you went and you received it. We oftentimes want to receive it. We want to bypass the spirit of God to get what we got. But what God has for us is revealed to us in our spirits. Is this getting too deep for everybody? We got to get to spirit. A lot of times we don't want to go that deep. We can pray superficial prayers. We can believe God and we can get, you know, emotional about it and we can jump up and down and pray, but you've got to get into a spirit. And athletes, the reason I mention those things, the people that knows to do that, you don't get the spirit until you're just totally frustrated with where you are. If you're doing things in a natural, it'll wear you out. It'll fatigue you. Anybody that plays instrument, I remember playing piano, and, and you just playing those, no, 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 and back and forth, and your hands get tired and just aches, and you keep doing, you get, and then if you keep doing long enough, what will happen 
it becomes effortless. And you're almost like you're just watching this thing. You're just, you're, not even, you're just a witness of what's going on. And as you start playing music, you no longer have to learn songs. Anything that's being played, you now are part of. Why? Because you're now an instrument. You become the instrument. Whatever you're playing, you become that. But you can't do that in your natural. You become your craft. You become whatever you're endeavoring to be. But that's a, that's a spiritual transformation that takes place. And most people can't stay in it long enough to get that much of what things happen. Now let me tell you something. When you get transformed to the world, you seem weird. Because it's just not common. Someone that's been transformed is no longer part of this world. Now you belong to something else. But people are experiencing something they've never experienced from you because you are no longer in your natural. And more people need to manifest in spirit. That's why when a person is, has that gift that God gives for healing, you can lay your hands on someone and they can be healed because what is in the spirit has just superseded what's in the natural. And that spirit always prevails. When you get into the spirit, whatever is about you that's natural has to yield to the spirit. Yes. The spirit is that powerful. If, you, if you're having an issue, let's say health, financial, whatever, you start praying in the spirit. You start believing God in the spirit. Then you start doing what the spirit directs you to do. And you'll see change and transformation happens. But we want to stay in the natural and we want things to change. But what you're asking for is a spiritual transformation, but you don't want to transfer into spirit to get it. But that's where it happens, in the spirit, in the spirit. Uh, I remember that back to the future, going back to that, when he went back into the past, he changed something in the back in the past. And what happened? It changed the things that happened in the present. The same thing, you go into the spirit, it changes things that's happening in the natural. You have power and control over that. On God's time. Here's so we get it on God's time. God is always on time, right? God may not always be in time, but he's always on time. End time is what we want. We want God to be in our, in our time frame. We want God to be in time, but God is always on time, which means God knows when. And we have to trust God's timing. It may not be our time or our time frame, but it's God's time. And God's what's called uh, uh, Kairos time. We have Chronos time, which chronologically is how we see things. As we see things in our dimension, God has Kairos time, which means God is the perfect time. It's the perfect time for God. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 2. This is what God says. Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. And God is just saying he's going to give you get a vision. And whatever God gives you, wait for the vision. Don't become anxious. Don't become too quick to want to have things right now. Because God has a time that is perfect for us. I'm going to look at this in the Message Bible. Same scripture in the Message Bible. It reads a little bit differently. Write what you see. Write it out in big block letters so that it can be read on the run. This vision message is a witness pointing to what's coming. It aches for the coming. It can hardly wait. And it doesn't lie. If it seems slow in coming, wait. It's on its way. It will come right on time. It will come. When anything moves from eternity into time, it is subject to our laws of time. Now, how long does it take sometimes for things to get from the heavenly realm to the earthly realm? We think it's all dependent on God. Sometimes that depends on us. How, how long does it take for us to get things done when we say it? When our word is spoken, how long does it take us to move and our word becomes true? So if, if we say we're going to do something, or whatever we, it's spoken, and there's a delay, then that's how it has to come to us. Remember, whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The way we do it here is the way God gives it to us. So we want on-time blessing, but when it comes to us, how on-time are we? Uh -oh. right. there we go. How consistent are we? 
Okay, we, we, if we're supposed to be at church every Sunday, but we can't come every Sunday, what if God drops your blessing off on a Sunday when you weren't here? Mm hmm Because God's following your time schedule. He just didn't drop it away. I dropped it off, but you weren't here. I didn't, didn't know what to do. I, somebody else got it. But we kind of want to be like we want to be, but when it comes to God, we want to have God do it on time. On Tuesday at 9, around 9.15, God. Oh, the way we do it, the way we do it is the way it comes back to us, right? We do it, the way we do it, God does it the same way. Uh, how can we handle timely matters now? The terms of God back to There was something that says you inspect what you expect. That means whatever we're expecting from, from God, whatever we believe in God for, inspect ourselves first. Inspect ourselves first. Because God will not allow us to have something that would burden us. If you cannot receive what God has for you, then that means it's not going to happen because God will not allow you to be burdened by that. We're believing God for something, but we have to prepare our way for the blessing. Our children used to bring, used to ask for things, and sometimes one would receive something, and then another one would want what the other one had. I shared before that when, when, when our youngest child, our youngest daughter would come and ask for something, and then the other one would want what the other one asked for, and I would say no. So well, you gave it to her. So yes. Well, why can't I have it? Because she came with her cup. She came ready to receive it. You get it? We're praying, but are we prepared for what God has prepared for us? Or do we have to go and get, ready, get, get stuff ready after it shows up? Because if you show with, a, with an expectation, like the widow, he says, go out and get empty vessels. Get empty vessels and not just a few. And she had to go out and, and ask for something that was empty. And he said, now I want you to pour into what you received. And I'm going to pour into what you have. I'm going to pour into what you have to the full. So if we don't bring God anything, how can God feel something? We got we to gotta, we gotta know God is, we're waiting for God. He's waiting for us. We're praying and believing God, and God's, you know, I'm waiting for you. God, I, God, I want to I win the lottery. God, give me the lottery. God says, buy a ticket then. Just buy a ticket. We want to believe God for something, but we have not done our part. Are we waiting on God, or is God waiting on us? For unto us, for unto us. God's time for unto us. For God hears. God hears. He knows that we need a Savior. He knows we need an Avenger. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 3, it says, We also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint. Now, here's what we do in times of hardship. Whenever you go through times of hardship and affliction, here's the number one thing. Rather than keep praying for God and asking God to give you your request, here's the thing you should be doing during any hardship. Submit yourself to God. Submit more and more to him. I mean, give, give up, sacrifice things so that you can submit more to God. Seeds of, a, a harvest of blessing is sown with seeds of sacrifice. A harvest of blessing is sown with seeds of sacrifice. God's looking for how much you give up to submit to him. We love, we can submit to God if everything is going well. If I got something to, hair, to wear, if I have my hair appointment, my hair is looking right, if I got, you know, I've got money, if I, whatever, if it's convenient, if I, if I don't have company in town, when it's, we, we, that's what we give God. But how often do we go out of our way where we got to cancel something for God, when you're faced with a priority, which one wins? I can't make it this Sunday. I can't make it because I got this coming up. I can't make it over here. And God knows sometimes you're set up for the blessing. Choose. Remember God says, every day I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He said that every day I set before you life, death, blessing, cursing. Then he tells to us, choose life. That means that every day you're going to be challenged to make the right choice. 
How often do we make the right choice? Because the right choice sometimes may not be the choice that you choose to make. Sometimes your right choice may be giving up this and choosing God or choosing something, the, the lesser, rather than and giving up the greater and choosing the lesser sometimes. That don't make any sense. I always be willing to accept less than what is allowed. Always be willing to do more than what is required. In doing so, you leave space for God to make up the blessing. Whenever you accept less than what's allowed, God knows what you just gave up. God knows the sacrifice. God says, I'm going to use that seed. I'm going I'm to give you a harvest on what you just gave up. You never lose when it comes to God. No one can ever take anything away from you when it comes to God. No one can cheat you when it comes to God. He keeps score. He knows exactly where you are. He knows what it takes. He knows the sacrifices that you make to be consistent day after day, Sunday after Sunday. I don't think anybody finds it convenient to be here every Sunday, the ones that show up. Sometimes you always got something you, you can be doing. In fact, sometimes you leave stuff undone so you can be here and be here on time. And God knows that. He will honor you for that. But when we just find any reason to not make it, oh, don't feel well, oh, don't have hot water today, well, can't make it, you know, whatever. Can't find matching socks, can't make it today. Any reason. But when we want to do something else that we want to do, right? We will pay that extra, we'll do whatever because the last one, it's on sale, I got to get it now, we'll do all that. But when we come here, we don't submit to God. What I'm saying is that when you're going through suffering, look for how you can submit more to God, not how you can ease your pain and suffering. Because God takes care of the pain and suffering. You just submit to God. God's got you. He's got you. He knows where you are. Don't try to be your own blessing. Be a blessing. And then let God take care of all the rest of that. They say whenever you try to make a blessing, you miss a blessing. Don't try to make your own blessings. Be a blessing. And here's another thing is store up blessings. Store up. That means that when you have an opportunity to be a blessing, don't try to receive then. Let God bless you in return. It's, it's going to come up in a moment. Let him bless you in return. Romans chapter 5, we went over that one. Uh, God, make a note. God may not take you out of suffering. God may not take you out of suffering. He may take you through it. He may not take you out. He may take you through. Now, when he says he's taking you through, that means he's with you, right? That lets you know it's going to be okay. As long as you know he's with you. And, and how do you know he's with you? Because he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Especially when you're going through those things. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. And though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, where is God? He says he's with you. His rod and his staff will comfort you. Be comforted by those words when you're going through it. You don't ever go through things by yourself. You may feel that you're alone. You may feel that, you know, that, that there's nobody there, but he's always there with you. Submit yourself to him. Draw closer to him during those times because he's with you. He's with you. The darkness at first seems overwhelming when we're going through it. But you know what happens if you stay in darkness long enough? What happens when you stay in darkness long enough? You begin to see, isn't it? Anybody ever, ever, ever witnessed that? You ever been in a dark place first, and then when you go in, you can't see anything, and your first thing is to want to what? Get out of there? But if you stayed in there, things began, you begin to see things, don't you? And sometimes you may see things in the darkness that you need. There's something that was prepared for you in there. But if you had walked away, you would have missed it. So sometimes in your dark seasons, I'm saying, God, may have something for you there. Don't pray your way out. Sometimes know that God is allowing you to be there because there's something that's only revealed to us during certain seasons. Some people learn how to pray and draw closer to God during dark times. You learn to 
persevere and to have faith to hold on during dark times. When I used to share before, when I used to develop, develop x-rays, now they don't develop anymore. That was a long time ago. When you develop film, now everything is digital. But back in the day, you had to go into a dark room to develop your film. And whatever photographs you took, you didn't, you didn't know what, what it looked like, what it was, until you went through the dark room and developed it, right? And whatever you developed was called a negative. You developed it from a negative. What I'm saying is your negatives develop in those dark places. In those dark places, God will take that negative and God will allow you to see yourself sometime in that darkness. And you'll come out of that darkness with a new perspective on who you really are. Some people didn't know how bad they were until they had to fall into a dark pit. And they realized nobody put you in that pit. Sometimes we allow ourselves, sometimes we have to stop and look at where we are and thinking, why am I here? And when we do and God come out of that, we come out differently. About Jonah, right? Jonah had, had instructions from God to go one direction. Jonah says, mm hmm. Jonah went another direction. <laughs> he, he went a whole other direction. He ended up in a very dark place, didn't he? Yeah. And for three days, he's in the belly of this great fish. For three days. And what do you think Jonah was thinking about during while he was there? Man, I can't wait till I get out of here. <laughs> and he knows that. God didn't put him there because he should have been somewhere else. And if he'd done what God told him to do, he'd have been okay, wouldn't he? But because he opposed God, he didn't submit to God, he ended up in a very, very dark place. And while he's there for three days, and when that fish finally spitted him up, Jonah said, one ticket to Nineveh, please. <laughs> he went straight there and did exactly what God told him to do, but but why did it take Jonah to get there? Why does it take us to get into those places before we realize who we really are? Remember the, the dark places, sometimes we need those. We see things that we don't see when the light is all around us. When everything is going well, we got so many blessings, but we don't count the God of the blessings. You didn't bless yourself. You're not here because you were so good and so wise and, and had everything right, did everything good. It's because of God's grace and God's mercy. You woke up this morning because of his mercy and his grace. Yeah. Amen. Some people didn't wake up. I don't know if you understand that. Every day there's somebody that went to bed last night and didn't wake up that morning. Yes. Could have been me. Could have been you. So that's why when you wake up in the morning, your first thing is to give God honor and glory and thank God for every day. Let's thank him right now for, what, for every day that he gives us. Yeah, it takes humility to stop and look at yourself and realize that not only are you not perfect, but we're wretched. We're wretched. We, we think we, we pump ourselves up and think that we're better than other people. No, deep down, there's nothing good about any one of us. It's God that looks beyond all of our faults and he sees us and he blesses us every day in spite of us. And we can't take any day anything else for granted. And we see other people, we've got to see them the same way that, that, that God sees us. We're flawed. We've got to think flawed people need love also. They need the love of Jesus. The same thing that he gives to us, we just give it to somebody else. God keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. How can you see good when everything around you is bad? That's a question that's asked sometimes. How can you praise God through suffering? It seems like, how, do you, how can you keep giving God glory when things are not where they should be? When the prophecy was given, when Isaiah said this, say, for unto us a son, is, a child is born, unto us a son is given. That was 800 years before Jesus showed up. 800 years before Jesus was born, as we know. But the prophet says he was born way back then. Why did it take 800 years? Sometimes it takes a long time because people are still trying to live up to the prophecy. They're ready, they couldn't receive Jesus because they weren't ready to receive him yet. Some people are asking and praying for something, but are you really ready for your praying, what you're praying for? Are you still harboring and holding on and defending your own weaknesses and setbacks? Well, I'm not perfect. You know, nobody's right. 
So we use that as a reason not to want to make changes. See, God has blessings for you, but God knows that there's a new you that can receive them. Think about it in scripture when Abraham was called by God, his first name was Abram. And Abram wasn't ready for the blessing. Abram had to go through testing. And one of the tests that Abram had to do to see if he really trusted God was that God allowed him to have a son named Isaac. And God told Abram, you will be the father of many nations. And God and Abram are just going along. And then God says, here's what I want you to do, uh, Abram. I want you to slay your son. He said, God, God, you told me that I would be the blessing of nations. If I kill him, how can I? Because he was already well in age. He didn't have any in mind any other children in him. God, why would I kill my son? I mean, he's thinking this. But the Bible says that he just believed God. And he went up to the place of the sacrifice. Now, Isaac did not know. And as they're going up to the sacrifice, Isaac looks at his father and says, Father, I know we have the wood here and we got the things for the fire, but where's the sacrifice that we're going to make when we get up there? And Abram said, the Lord will provide. Amen. The words that he spoke became the prophecy. What are you speaking during those times? He said, the Lord will provide. And, and just as he put Isaac there, he was about to raise the knife to slay his son. He says, the voice of God said, do not harm the boy. Because now I know. Now I know. In other words, God says, now I understand that, that you will follow me. That you would not even spare your only son. And at that time, God provided a ram in the thicket that became the sacrifice. But see, I, Abram was proved before he received the blessing. It says, your name will no longer be Abram. Your name is now Abraham. There's a transition from the old person to the new because the blessing was for the new. As we're believing God for whatever we're praying for and believing God for, there's a newness that God wants from us. The same old person that you are will receive what God has, and you may do the same thing that the old person does, but what is new will receive what is new and will honor God with what he gives you. Create in me, David said, a new heart. Create the right spirit in me. Ask God for that newness within you. And as God blesses you, he blesses you with the promise of what he's given. And lastly, it was 800 years before what they were ready to walk in obedience. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of, of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. They were praying for God to give them blessing and to change things, and what God gave them was a prophecy. God says, things will be well with you, a child is born. God gave them a prophecy. It's like, God, I, we, we need something here. We need, we need, we need, and God's giving you a prophecy. Rejoice over the prophecy. Sometimes God will give you something in your, you know, a vision of something, maybe while you're sleeping, a dream. And that dream would be a prophecy or a preview of what God has for you. Whenever you see the preview, rejoice over the preview. God blesses us oftentimes through visions and through dreams. When we see those dreams and visions, know that he's in our life. Everybody here is praying for something. Everyone here is believing God for more. I believe it. But whom much is given, much is what? Required. To whom much is given, much is required. And God says, I have so much in store for you. 
more than your eye has seen, more than your ear has heard. I've got things that you can't even perceive for you. But if God has those for you, you have to ask yourself, what is God requiring of you? Rise up to the level of the blessing. Rise up from wherever you are. You believe in God for more. God's also believing you for more. Rise up. God knows who we're capable of. And God wants us to be everything that he desires us to be. Almighty God, thank you for your blessing, for your favor, for your goodness. For we know, God, as you spoke that word to your people in a difficult and desperate time, we cry out right now in desperate times. And you tell us unto us that son is born, unto us a, a child is given. Thank you, God, for Jesus. That we can celebrate him not just during this season, but in every day that we can stand on the mountaintops and say joy to the world. The Lord not only is come, the Lord has come. And he's coming back again. Allow our hearts, O oh Lord, to be sensitive to those that have needs during this season. To reach out and extend love and mercy and forgiveness and peace. Allow our light to shine where the light is needed. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you never prayed the prayer of salvation. I'm going to give you some words. Just repeat these words and believe them with all of your heart. Just say, Father, forgive me. Thank you for being with me always. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me and that God raised him from the dead. By this confession, I'm saved. I make Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. You may be a backslider, which means you've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you need to recommit yourself to him. Just ask him right now to come into your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for always being there. Mold me now to what you have me to be. Use me. Take out this heart of stone Give me a heart of flesh. I make Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. And Father God, for those who pray.